So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce one of our newest board members at the COG, El Segundo Mayor Drew Boyles. El Segundo is a dynamic city that's been voted the most business-friendly city two times by the LA Economic Development Corporation. It's attracting major business to the South Bay, including, most recently, the Los Angeles Times. Thanks to Drew, our keynote speaker today represents that new El Segundo business, and he will introduce our keynote speaker. And Drew. Good afternoon. So uh, in addition to being mayor of El Segundo, I'm also an entrepreneur. So it's amazing to sit next to or, or stand next to this next individual who's going to be speaking today, because in the four minutes that we were watching Joshua and the incredible things that Edison is talking about doing, he fired off probably a half a dozen ideas of things that he's going to be doing in El Segundo, how he can help Edison further their cause. Amazing, very difficult to keep up with this man, actually. His pace is unbelievable. Um, and I can tell you that we pride ourselves, our tagline as a city, and I think we live up to it, is where big ideas take off. El, El Segundo is the birthplace of GPS, LA Air Force Base, so many different things happen in our great town. And this next individual is a perfect example. He is, I sat down with him at lunch once, and we had the map of El Segundo out. And he was like, I hope he doesn't get offended by this, but a kid in a candy shop. Like, who owns that building? What are they doing with this property here? Voracious appetite for growth, for progress. He's a physician, a surgeon, a scientist, an inventor, a technologist, and a major philanthropist. He was born and raised during apartheid in South Africa, and Southern California has been his home since 1980. He was recently honored as the LA Area Chamber of Commerce's distinguished business leader. This was in part because he purchased the LA Times, and he moved it to, where did he move it, everybody? Thank you very much. In fact, uh, Mayor Garcetti does a great convening of mayors, and we were fortunate enough to host it in El Segundo recently, and I said, can we please host that at the LA Times? No, it's a little too, too soon. <laughs> Uh, and he also bought the San Diego Tribune last year. And he's restoring local ownership to two vital journalism organizations. I've heard him speak on several occasions. He's very passionate about preserving free speech and using that medium for that cause. Before he acquired the LA Times, you might have heard of him because he, he had his pioneering work to treat cancer using the human body's own immune system. So in El Segundo, under FDA trials, and his wife has an, have an institute where they basically take the killer cells in your body, they spin them up, and they put them back into your body using immunotherapy. Incredibly promising technology. Um, it's amazing that it's happening in our town. He also loves basketball. He's one of the owners of the Lakers. He's working on a very exciting new basketball project that I won't mention today that maybe he'll touch on. And today he's here to talk to us about his efforts to drive adoption of affordable, reliable green energy through his company, Nant Energy, which is a fast-growing energy storage company. So perfect segue with Joshua and Edison. Thank you for that. And so it's my great honor to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Patrick Soon Shung. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much. Um, you know, when Drew asked me to give a talk, I wasn't sure what the subject's going to be. So I thought what I would do is take you on a very quick tour of what Nantworks is about. So um, to, to describe really what we do, this is not a uh, one-year project. This is literally, as I said, a hundred-year journey where we thought we had to take not just what we're doing, but really for the nation. And. As you all know from the world that I came uh, as a surgeon scientist, and I was a NASA scientist, I was a surgeon at UCLA, developed a pancreas transplant and work on cancer. It soon dawned on me that you, all of us here, have within our human bodies the ability to treat your own disease and specifically cancer. It may sound strange. And one of the things I began to realize, sadly, is that the chemotherapy that's been given to us. Um, in our training as well as what you're receiving is actually wiping out your immune system 
an almost uh, predestining failure. So the challenge we have to bring here is this whole new concept, is that how we can obsolete chemotherapy and overcome the disease, and I'll share with you that. So these are some of the existential things that are really impactful to, to us and to you and your children, your grandchildren. One is um, cancer, infectious disease, TB, uh, HIV. The other thing that is truly, I think, and this is where the LA Times will have to take this position now, really sound the alarm. We talk about climate change, we don't talk about, we, talk, we think this is gonna happen maybe two, three, four, five generations from now, or maybe 100 years from now. It's actually gonna affect your grandchildren. That if we don't get this two degrees centigrade or four degrees centigrade reduction uh, within the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, we will truly have a existential crisis. You begin to see, I think, these California fires, the things that we're having, this climate change, this coldest winter that we have here now, is one of the real effects that's really happening in real time. There'll come a point where we actually tip and there's no return. Um, and that's what happened at the dinosaur level, right? So this is literally not even um, a concept. So uh, there's no point in curing cancer if you're not even here. So, so, so one of the things we've taken on, um, again, very much like in nature, there is in the sea, there is in the water, and there is in the air, believe it or not, all the energy that we need. And so that's taken a very different approach. Again, this is what we'll be, I'll be sharing with you in a very short period of time. Now, one of the things that needs to do, we do very complex stuff, whether we talk about, you're not hearing me? I'm going to echo on this thing now. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, one, one of the things we do very complex, we talk about the whole genome sequencing, we talk about things like the neoepitope, we talk about uh, energy, talk about hydrocarbons, and this is not English. So you need to figure out a way in which we need to create content and connectivity so that we can communicate at a level uh, that makes sense to a lot of people. But when I just heard about this connectivity, um, what we've been building for the last 15 years, I took over the thing called the National Lambda Rail, which is this fiber infrastructure uh, that actually connected every university and actually what was used for the astrophysicist to discover God's particle. The only way that could work is that thousands of physicists across the world would work in real time with the same data. I realize that in fact, as we're developing cancer, the human genome, there's God's particle in every one of us every day, which we need to uh, understand. So I needed to build supercomputing infrastructure that interconnected 150 data centers across the United States. So we built that fiber. We have 200,000 fiber miles completely controlled and owned by Nantworks so that we can do supercomputing. I started this in Culver City and now we completely connected all of Culver City. We're completely connecting all of El Segundo. And when I heard about your project just two minutes ago, about fiber connectivity of uh, the 15 cities, It'll be a real easy thing for you to all get connected to this. We move data terabytes a second. We have something like 80 petabytes of data, and it's cyber secure. But with that connectivity, you could then engage and then create uh, over the top video, um, podcast, paper, um, news. And this is what then would allow us to create what tru truly a new social network of truthful news rather than fake news. So the, co the concept then to engage, inspire, and educate. So when you look at this, it looks like this disparate, crazy uh, organization that has very little connectivity. But at the end of the day, we're moving photons, which is from the sun or energy. We're moving bits, which is whether through the fiber or connectivity. We're creating synapses, whether it's in our supercomputers with the artificial intelligence or whether it be electrical synapses. And we're really augmenting intelligence. We recreated this thing called machine vision and look, tell, money reader, if some of you want to download that, allows the blind to see using your phone. We're generating energy now, and I'll share that with you. We're really treating diseases, and we really, with all of that, will be able to end famine. 
using a thing called hydroponics, and we really believe it will change lives. So, so this is the um, vision and mission. And every time I go into a city, we went into Culver City, we outgrew the space in Culver City. We took close to maybe, I think, we have close to 15 to 20 acres in Culver City. We went to El Segundo, and the mayor was correct. Um, I started looking at spaces, and I think we're now into maybe, maybe another 20 acres in El Segundo. And just, the mayor, you may not like this, but we're now in Redondo Beach, right? We went to Redondo, and we just took another five acres there. So the idea of us being down the South Bay and actually creating a, an environment of our infrastructure to address this, uh, this issue. So let me take you through this journey um, so you can see this is not some wild goose chase. Uh, this natural killer cell. Each of you sitting here today have in your body a cell called the natural killer cell. It was uh, in order for mammalians to exist, so it's hundreds of millions of years ago that your human body, uh, that a mammalian cell, the natural killer cell had to first be born because it is the cell that recognizes whether you get TB, infection, um, uh, virus, or cancer. So when your cells change in your body, and your cells are changing as you're sitting here talking to me because these are stem cells in order for your body to regenerate, there is inevitable errors that happens in those stem cell generation. Your body was born to create these errors so you can actually create your new, new tissue, whether it be blood, heart, muscle. And what happens to these cells that have errors? Well, it turns out it's the natural killer cell in your body that finds them and kills them. And if you have, as you age, these natural killer cells get weaker and the cancer finds a way to put them to sleep, and the cancer grows. So we have discovered a universal natural killer cell that we can now grow in an unlimited supply, identify your cancer, target this natural killer cell. So this is a HER2, which is a HER2 target for breast cancer. The red is a cancer. And the natural killer cell, literally, this is a microscope view, finds it, tracks it down, and kills it. And this is how this natural killer cell works. You all know about the drug called Herceptin. And how the Herceptin works, is it acts an antibody that links on to the breast cancer. Well, the only way Herceptin works, it actually combines itself with the natural killer cell. So we've now taken a natural killer cell with a Herceptin antibody and it's tracked down this natural killer, this cancer, and as you can see, it's putting these granzymes or these bullets into the cancer, red cancer cell, and exploding them. And now comes the T cells. This is the future of, 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 of cancer care. Um, I spent 10 years of my life building this. <clears throat> One of the things I wanted to do was to build this infrastructure so we went to Culver City and then we went to El Segundo and we launched this institute called the Chan Soon Chung Institute for Medicine. The reason I needed to build this institute was we wanted to, this was the Raytheon Research Center. Um, I knew I needed to start the trial. I think I took over the building in 2016. I said I wanted to start the trial. It's a 100,000 square foot manufacturing nothing facility could I actually very quickly open up a clinic because I knew I was going to get FDA approval to initiate the trial. I also knew that I'm going to go after or go against large pharmaceutical interests that would not appreciate the fact that we're going to take away a huge element of revenue of high-dose chemotherapy. So I knew that we needed to very quietly build this clinic and build it to the state of the art. In less than three months, we built this clinic and then actually launched this natural killer cell. The next thing I knew we needed to do was find a way that we could freeze the cell so that we can send it anywhere in the country. 
and then thaw it and hang it in a bag and then identify the tumor type and create a vaccine like a flu shot and in 2000, August 2017 the world's first patient Nel Segundo received uh, this natural killer cell. I'm completely aware of a HIPAA. Uh, this patient has asked for me to please announce his name, tell the world he's 35 years old with metastatic pancreatic cancer spread throughout his body and came to us and he was the first patient we gave this natural killer cell. Two beautiful children, young children, so 2017, I'm pleased to show 2018. <laughs> the father-daughter dance, and he just made us another gift by showing me 2019. So now he's two years, um, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say that uh, this is a real technology. So we are now in trials um, for bladder cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, head and neck cancer. And clearly this clinic is going to explode. When I just said to the mayor, we're now building out the rest of this clinic. I, I complain a little bit that we can't get the electric, electricity into the building, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, and we're building um, facilities around. But quite seriously, um, uh, how do you s scale manufacturing for one human being at a time um, where you need to build what you call these GMP rooms? And that's impossible. So we also invented another technology called a GMP in the box, where this single box could be for one patient and completely self-controlled, in which we can actually do now take advantage of artificial intelligence where we can actually monitor the box and shake the box and completely monitor this completely in the cloud where the entire process of this manufacture for one single patient from beginning to end can be automated, controlled and internally controlled so that we could have then these GMP in the box factories. So in El Segundo will be the world's first GMP in the box factory. Uh, we'll be um, opening that within the next three, three months, plus or minus the electricity. Uh, <laughs> but we've also expanded this into Culver City, and some of you may see on Jefferson Boulevard a massive building that's going up there um, on Jefferson Boulevard. What we've done is taken the fiber connectivity so that El Segundo and Culver City are now integrated um, and we tied all the way to one Wilshire and tied to 150 data centers, tied all the way to Europe, all the way to Tokyo, moving data terabytes a second. It is the fastest moving fiber network now in the country, um, tied to a layer two uh, cyber security. So that was the beginnings of the cancer side. And I know time doesn't permit so few, if I say, overgo my stage, just pull me off the stage. But I'm now going to take you to chapter two. Uh, uh, and there's obviously much more to talk about on the, on, the, on the health side. With regard to this energy source of the future and hydrocarbons and famine, I think this is the world as you look at it today. Most of the world, uh, the undeveloped world, has no electricity. But I think if you look at California, and the right-hand side, the best way to understand it, is look at the amount of fantastic energy we'll be generating. That's 13 gigawatt hours. I, I know that sounds googly gook, and, and, and within solar, 30 gigawatt hours, which basically says we'll be, store, we'll be generating enormous amounts of energy, which is fantastic. The problem is how are we going to store this energy? So why everybody has been focusing on um, generation, wind, um, solar, there's been very little focus on storage. And un until you can store it, you really can't use it when you need it. And the lithium ion storage. So this has been a problem forever, where lead acid was the first form of storage and is still 
the storage in Mosul. Okay, well, I'm told I've got 10 minutes, so I'll... I'll I think you've been overruled, or do I? <laughs> no, I don't want to be rude. You tell me when you, you pull me off. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, and Edison tried to solve this problem, and he failed, believe it or not. And he filed a patent and failed. So we discovered, and through a group in Arizona, in Arizona University, discovered that they were trying to work on the thing called zinc air. So imagine zinc is in your body. Zinc is what you need to actually to make insulin. I worked with zinc as part of my NASA scientist program. And when I discovered there was a zinc air battery trying to be developed, this was the holy grail. Because if you could take oxygen from the air and take zinc, which is, has no fire and can be stable and can be retained for years and years and years, you will then break the code of uh, energy storage. So here is this power cell now, the modular system. And this is not some fairy tale. We now have the world's only and world's first zinc air battery system that combines, if you want, with lithium ion and, and, and capacitors. And we have now deployed it throughout the world. Uh, for over six years, we've electrified 100 villages, 200,000 people completely off the grid. And the first factory, again, will be built in El Segundo. Um, and as you said, I sort of plunked myself into El Segundo, but I'm happy to move south and or north. <laughs> um, but I have to, because I think we need to distribute this across. There's been 3,000 systems now. And the three um, ways we're doing this, on the one hand, we're putting this in, two, there's been 2,000 sites that we've now put them in with, with industrial customers since 2012. We have on the, in the middle there 113 remote microgrids truly running 200,000 people completely off the grid. And we've now launched ourselves with, uh, in, in commercial industries and customers of peak shavings and reducing the load we acquired sharp technology, which is from the sharp industry, so we can integrate that. And so this is an example with the global deployment in Indonesia. This is how it's running. The manufacture of this thing is so simple that we've actually launched manufacturing in Indonesia. They've manufacturing these batteries now in Indonesia, and we can monitor this in real time. And now you begin to see the remote areas in which we put this, completely remote completely running um, and without any um, uh, off-the-grid power uh, with island microgrids. I think it's hard to see with that picture there, but uh, these islands are completely running. What's exciting is we're monitoring the cell in real time here in, in Arizona uh, off the, on the web. We know exactly when each cell is charging or discharging. We're also doing this in Africa. We've now launched in Africa. We've launched in um, Madagascar. Uh, we've just got the war to do all of Haiti. Um, and we've also launched in the United States. What's most exciting for Duke Energy in Mount Sterling, this grid survived two hurricanes. And, be <laughs> and because it survived two hurricanes, the Duke Energy was able to give 13 acres back to of land to the federal government because it didn't require transmission lines any longer from that perspective. So this was published in the New York Times. And then we've also launched in Central America. Uh, we've launched in uh, all over the world. I think it's time to launch in the United States. Uh, <laughs> so again, we'd love to work with the, your, the cities here now and start talking to you about how we can aid you through telecom microgrid uh, so uh, this issue of storage, we think we are not only the right track, it's safe, there's no cooling required, it's not lithium ion, lithium requires cobalt, the rare metals, the toxicity, the fire. So this is the area that we are focusing on. I suppose this is Los Angeles. <laughs> so this is the next thing with regard to really part of the issue. That, so the idea is how could we create transport? And I'm not talking about lift or 
or, or, but really, if this possible, to create a machine that is solar powered that can actually do This is on Venice Beach, uh, this machine um, that is self-balancing and um, is run fully by a battery, can go up to 30 miles an hour, um, can um, be, uh, go for as long as, I, we think now 40 miles without charging. There's only three of these now in the world. Um, it was designed by uh, Nathan. Um, at the Cal Arts and a beautiful design. Uh, we are now building this factory, sorry to say again, in El Segundo. <laughs> uh, and so this factory then, uh, where we were actually using um, uh, flexible solar together with uh, ba battery packs, you notice it's completely um, self-balancing. So it's a revolutionary machine um, that um, we'll put a seat on and uh, that'll be hopefully a, a form of transport um, that'll change. Finally, and I'm getting nervous because I know your timing, so please just pull me off here. With regard to the hydrocarbons, I think truly now this is where you get really, very, really, very really serious. I mean, at an industrial scale, this carbon pollution that is facing us, the plastic pollution is killing the world and then the mining destruction. You know, I don't know if anybody realizes in order for you to make uh, paper even, this has to happen. In order for you to make cement, this has to happen. In order for you to make even the, the coal burning, this has to happen. So this is unsustainable for the planet, this mining destruction, this plastic pollution. So I'm not going to go into details on this because that's a huge subject matter. But I'm excited to say we have now taken this at scale, I'm talking about scale, countries, in which we are now building a next generation nanoparticle biopolymer together with graphene. The biopolymer is completely renewable, it's basically organic, it's, it's made by a bacterium, and we'll have billions of tons of this, in which I'm trying to work and replace plastics we'll actually change how you actually uh, generate carbon from um, um, the um, uh, coal burning plants and it'll be a powerful water remediation tool that you actually can recover and clean water. So this uh, is our, our big pursuit and these are the materials that we're working on and which will actually huge, uh, create a way for us uh, We have the first prototypes already, the first paper plates, the first utensils. I have that on my desk. We created the first toys um, and we passed all the tests. So this is the beginning of where we go with regard to um, the sun and air. Now finally the LA Times. So, uh, <laughs> and we're not going to call it the El Segundo Times. <laughs> So the good news about this, it's been, July will be one year. Um, uh, if I may tell the story, uh, Mr. May, I'll tell the story that in March, uh, in February, I decided I'm going to close the deal in the LA Times. Uh, they told me that, they, uh, that the lease ends in June uh, downtown. Um, the building I had was the direct TV building that was going to be my cancer center. It was complete nothing, uh, eight stories of where we ripped out everything from the DirecTV building, there was nothing there. And I had three months that I needed to move 700 people, the complete newsroom, for which I had very little idea of what they needed. I went to El Segundo and explained that issue to them, that we have a design, we want to create the most modernized newsroom, completely integrated newsroom, I needed to have eight floors done for 700 people completed from scratch, in which I'm also going to cut a hole in the floor in each floor so I can create steel stairwell between eight floors, and I needed to do all that in three months. And we did. So uh, congratulations. Uh, when you work together with the local government, you, you really see the beginnings of that. 
we moved everybody in in July of last year, so it's not even a year yet. Um, I then realized what we need to do is change this, not paper, that we need to actually now also bring information in every form, including TV. And Spectrum is just around the corner. So we started a relationship with Spectrum and launched the LA Times TV show with Spectrum. And that's called LA Times Today. We launched this in February. Um, and we created this video. And now if you are a Spectrum, now a Spectrum salesperson, if you are Spectrum 1, um, this went, uh, and I'll share with you, uh, the results of our first week was we beat every local TV station for our local news at 7 o'clock, right? So this is a news magazine that you could now go. So I think um, we've now addressed really um, the, the, this, this element that truly the human body you can untap. The sun and sea and air you can untap. And we'll be working very hard to uh, untap the power of the brand of LA Times. So please subscribe. We need your subscription. <laughs> okay. well, thank you. Yes, we um, do have time for a, a couple of questions. And um, I, maybe I'll throw out the first one to you, uh, Doctor. Um, just amazing information on your research, medical research. Um, what are the chances? We heard earlier about the aging of our population. And of course, with that comes, uh, along with longer life, Many people have experienced Alzheimer's, and that's something everyone's concerned about. What are the chances of, I know it's early research, uh, applying that sort of thing to the beta amyloid protein plaques and, right. and tau tangles that have been identified? Yes. So people are talking about questions in Alzheimer's. We actually have a program in Alzheimer's, and we're actually in phase one clinical trials, which I've not talked about here. It turns out I believe that Alzheimer's and MS is really an autoimmune disease, that actually what's happening is your body, including the natural killer cells, believe it or not, is attacking your myelin sheaths uh, because it's not recognizing it, it's thinking it's some foreign material as you age. So these are the kinds of things that we're working on, again, counterintuitively, where we're actually taking an anti-inflammatory approach Alzheimer's disease, but it's, it's promising. We also have treatment for HIV, and uh, we have some very exciting studies in monkeys with HIV that we've affected with HIV and acutely prevented and, and blocked the HIV. So I think these are the issues that, because of the, of the uh, power of some of the systems we now have with genomics and, in, and understanding the human body, we'll get closer to. It's very exciting. Very sure. exciting. Um, we have one other question that uh, did come in uh, previously uh, regarding cities currently using the lead acid batteries to back up critical traffic lights and other infrastructure. And what are the benefits of using zinc gear over lead, uh, the lead acid batteries? Well, first of all, lead acid batteries, as you know, one is toxic, very toxic, and the waste it requires. Two, sadly, in not maybe this country, but in developed countries, is always stolen. Third, th so what we have discovered and done, we've actually integrated a thing called flexible solar, where we can actually create solar with completely flexible next generation solar panels with our zinc air batteries, together with a thing called capacitors that actually can manage traffic lights very rapidly. So we can replace all the lead acid batteries. In fact, we've done that completely for villages. We've replaced, it, replaced a million lead acid batteries in the world so far. Wonderful. Uh, one other one that came in. We have a number of data centers in the South Bay. How could these businesses use your energy storage systems? Both again. So we're about in, in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, about to take over um, a landfill, believe it or not, 
um, where it's very hard for them to build. And we're going to put our entire solar panels on that landfill, tie that to our, uh, our um, uh, energy storage system, and tie that to the data center. So this may be a first data center ever that was going to be run on green system. So we're happy to come to your data centers and, and work with that, not only um, do the peak shavings, but also interconnect them to our fiber network infrastructure. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor? Yes. Okay, so thank you first for rescuing the Times from the, uh, from the Tribune. Um, <laughs> I have a question about um, solar storage. So it seems like you've been focused on utility scale stuff, uh, which is probably appropriate given things like you know, Hornsdale Power Reserve in Australia. There's a success story there that, that isn't being seen here. As a homeowner with solar panels, I'd like to do my own little microgrid, and there's plenty of people like me, but that market is not being addressed very well. It's, it's pretty much just lithium ion and, and a whole host of very small people. So I was curious if you were going to expand to include us residential folks who would just like to do our bit too. No, I, I completely agree. In fact, that's one of the debates we have internally, right? Uh, it's really our ma manufacturing capacity, but now we, we think we'll f truly fix that by actually opening this plant. I know you have these power packs and the Tesla power packs and the lithium ion. Again, these are the problems that I worry about because this lithium ion has real fire, and as you know, in New York, they actually banned it uh, in New York. And so it's ideally, our, our storage system of zinc is ideally situated for that. We've not penetrated the local community level because it requires a, a significant um, force to go, to go out and do that. But now that we are quite sharp uh, as an organization, we'd be ready and happy to sort of talk to whatever the local community is and how we can actually create cities that want to take this on. Okay, well, I'm not worried about the city. I'm just me, residential customer. Sign me up, brother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have one more over here. Uh, yes, uh, I represent the city of Hawthorne, which is right next to El Segundo. And we have this, <laughs> we got this huge mall that's uh, vacant that we're looking for somebody with uh, some ingenuity to come along. And, and, and in addition, we have a hospital that's been closed down for uh, 15 uh, or more years. Wow. So. We'd like you to well, take I'll a ride. I'll come right. talk to you right out there. Okay, <laughs> good. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Wonderful sales pitch right there in front of all of us. <laughs> yes, one more. Man, I, I'm a uh, long-time subscriber to the LA Times. Good for you. <laughs> and enjoy it. And I have it delivered every day, and I also get it emailed to me every day. I know I'm probably not your long-term audience, but what do you see as the future of print journalism, both nationally and LA Times in particular? I kept on saying that the only way, I would be the last man standing printing because I know the touch and feel of a paper is so important. But you've got to support us where the, we actually, for every paper we send you, we actually lose money because they've taken away all the advertising. So this is where this Fair Use Act, we have to fight together. It's unfair use. Google and Facebook take all our work. We are what now? Um, New York Times has 1,400 newspaper men, uh, news reporters. We have now we've gone from 300 to 500 reporters. Every p word that they write painstakingly is taken for free by Google and Facebook, put out there for eyeballs. And that's where all the mm -hmm. advertisers go. So, and they hide behind the fact that they are platform, and this is Fair Use Act. And that's why you're having this destruction of every newspaper across this country. That is so dangerous for all of us. Mm -hmm. So the only way we can fight back now is to go, I'm gonna to continue to print, but we need digital subscription. We need the community. I need a million subscribers. New York Times now has four million subscribers. That's what survives them. We have 200,000 digital subscribers. So we need digital subscribers. So I'm building, improving the app. I'm improving the web. Now, that's taken me less than a year, but we will. By, by in, we're launching a new version first in San Diego, which is a small community. So the answer is you have to help me as a community to fight for ourselves. 
this paper is too important. I know that if I hadn't taken it over, we were down to 300 people. They were moving all the news into Chicago and they were gonna shut down our Washington bureau and actually shut down. That's a disaster for LA, it's a disaster for the community. So one, we will continue to print. Two, we really need digital subscribers. How, how do you attract those digital subscribers? I suppose this is the first time I've ever gone out asking. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. So I just said to my people, we need to go market this issue, right? Because mm -hmm. we feel too much. And, and I need to now speak openly about how unfair Google and Facebook has been to, to, to this entire industry. Right. Yes. Well, thank you. I think that's the end of our question time. But I hope you can feel the love here. And we are so thrilled to welcome you to the South Bay. And thank you so much for thank coming. You. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I think the, the opportunity to have them all convene in one spot and actually explain very complex information about our work in health, energy, and, and also now the media with the LA Times is, uh, was an important opportunity to address a large community. We're unique in Southern California or in California, right? We have 88 in LA counties, 88 cities. Um, and a population of 10 to 14 million people. So the ability to actually give this information in a concentrated way to some leadership and people with policy making was, was fantastic.